Okay, so welcome everyone to the penultimate Exoplanet presentation lounge of this semester. And our first speaker today joins us all the way from Portugal, and that is Babatunde Akinsami. And he is a fourth year graduate student at the University of Porto. And prior to this, Babatunde completed his bachelor's degree at the Federal University of Technology in, in Akure in Nigeria. Prior to moving to Porto for his master's and PhD, where he currently works with the Dr. Susanna Barros on detecting novel exoplanet features, including circumplanetary rings, tidal deformation and rotation induced oblateness. And today he will be talking about how ringed planets could be disguising as puffy planets. So Tunde, if you could go ahead and share your screen, please. Um. You can see that? Yep, that's all good. Thank you all so much for having me today. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, some work that I've been developing during my PhD, which is on the search for exoplanets, uh, search for rings around exoplanets. Um, and particularly, I'll be talking about how ring planets can actually disguise themselves as puffy planets. And I'll be taking the particular case of this planet, HIP 41378, uh, which actually appeared to be very puffy from the observations uh, using Kepler. And this result was published in this paper. So we, we all know that rings are exciting features, uh, which are found around all the giant planets of the solar system. But they've surprisingly been also found or detected around smaller bodies of the real solar system, like Chariklo, Chiron, and Haumea. But I say this is surprising because the rings were thought to be exclusive features of giant planets. The properties of the rings can vary a lot from Saturn, which has very bright rings and, and having some opaque regions also to some dusty uh, rings around Jupiter and the other planets. But all of this rocky ob uh, ringed object in the solar system has increased our curiosity about rings and the possibility of having them also around exoplanets. And these are referred to as exo rings, if you will. And there are a couple of reasons why it's, it could be interesting to search for rings uh, around exoplanets. First off, we have to uh, kind of imagine that some of the formation processes that are caught within the solar system were also replicated in some of these planetary systems. So the things that we see here should, uh, in some sense, be replicated in these other planetary systems. And finding rings around exoplanets can provide information about uh, planet formation and also moon formation, because we know that uh, the moons and the rings, they can co-evolve as we see them around the rings of the solar system and planets. And also detecting rings around exoplanets could actually help us detect some other kind of rings because it's possible that uh, rings around exoplanets could be rocky instead of the mostly icy rings that we have in the solar system. And so we could potentially detect rocky rings around planets that are within the snow line uh, of, the, of exoplanets. Also detecting exo rings will help us to understand some of the lingering questions that we have about rings. For instance, at what point are they formed? How long do they last for? And other questions as such. Transiting planets provide uh, a very apt opportunity to actually probe for the presence of rings around exoplanets because the, uh, the presence of rings around an exoplanet would modify the standard shape of the transit light curve that we observe. Because uh, a ring around the planet would block additional area, it would cause a deeper transit than we usually would have observed for a planet by itself. But also the additional radial extent of the ring will cause uh, you to observe a longer transit than, uh, than usual. As you seen in the, uh, in the image on the right here uh, is a depiction of uh, the transit of a ring planet. And you can see what I just described, a deeper and a longer transit due to the presence uh, of rings. So talking about uh, what do we observe or how do we uh, model the transit of a ring planet across, uh, across the disk of its star. We have to include additional four parameters to describe uh, these rings, and two of which are the inner and the outer radii of the ring, which define uh, how big or how large the rings are. Uh, we also have two rotation angles, IR and theta. IR is the inclination of the ring from the sky plane, so that when, the, when IR is equal to zero, we have a face on ring system, as is seen in the first uh, case here. But when IR is equal to zero, we have an edge on ring system. And in this case, you see that the projected uh, area of the ring disk is uh, negligible. And this is also what we see with uh, Saturn, for instance, when uh, the rings are edge on. 
the second angle is theta, which is the obliquity of the ring uh, from the orbital uh, from the orbital plane. In the right figure, I show again uh, the transit of a Saturn-like planet with and without rings. And we see also again, the longer and the deeper transits uh, caused by the presence of rings. But of course, one would say that this deeper transit can be attributed to a larger planet without rings, uh, which would be the case actually, if we didn't know that this planet had rings, one would just assume that this, uh, this transit was caused uh, by a bigger planet. But also if we take the measurement of the mass of these planets, we expect rings to have negligible mass, right? So the mass of the planet will remain essentially unchanged. And this will lead to a very low density when combined with the infrared radius of the planets. So as the planet would appear to be puffy, and um, we can already start to get a glimpse that something is up with this planet because if we cannot explain the puffiness, then uh, something, some several mechanic mechanisms can be responsible uh, for this. However, it is possible that uh, we observe these subtle features that I mark in green in the transit light curve, which is essentially due to the successive ingress of the ring, the gap, and then the planet. And so that when you fit a ring planet observation, such as the blue one here, with the planet only model, you have anomalies in the ingress and the egress period, pre, uh, periods, uh, phases, which could actually betray the presence of rings around these planets. But essentially, this can be very difficult uh, to detect because the, the amplitude of these signals can be very small and in some cases they will be undetectable. And this is why it's, uh, it's possible to actually use uh, a ring planet to mimic uh, the signatures uh, the, or the observed transit light curve of a puffy planet. So unless we're able to actually uh, probe these anomalies that are caused by the presence of rings, it will be difficult to distinguish between a puffy planet and uh, a ring planet. Moving over to uh, to examples of puffy planets, there have been uh, there has been quite a small uh, number of super puff planets, as they are called, uh, detected, and a lot of them have densities below 0.1 gram, 0.1 grams per cm cube. As you can see in the image on the left, they have sizes uh, similar to those of Saturn and Jupiter, but their masses are similar to those of Neptune and Uranus. So that when you compute the densities, you then have these very, very low densities. And actually, if one were to observe the transit of Saturn across the star, one would actually uh, overestimate its radius by a factor of 1.5, and also underestimate its density by less than half, which means that it's possible for some of these super puff planets to actually be ring planets that are being that are in disguise, if you will. Uh, the Kepler 51 system here are uh, prime examples of these super puff planets that have been detected. But unfortunately, uh, most of these super puff host stars are not bright enough, so we don't we cannot achieve a good enough precision to actually probe for the presence of rings. But luckily for us, uh, this uh, bright star HIP 41378 was found uh, in the K2 during the K2 mission to host another super puff planet, which is the F planet in this case. It's a giant planet with a radius of up to 9.2 uh, Earth radii. But uh, with a mass measured using the half spectrograph, we came up with a density of 0.09 grams per cm cube, which puts it very firmly in the class of uh, super puff planets. So what we essentially did here uh, was to try to, to, to see if it's possible to explain the low density of this planet with uh, a ring planet scenario. This is a good target to actually try to do this because it has a very long period of 542 days. And this is good for ring stability because uh, you can have a very large hue radius to actually support rings. And also you avoid a lot of tidal interaction with the star. And also you can be cold enough, um, the temperatures can be cold enough to support maybe the kind of rings that we observe within the solar system. So essentially to probe the presence of uh, rings around this planet, what we did was to perform a Bayesian model comparison between the ring planet model and the planet only model. Uh, essentially, we're comparing the evidence for each of the model given the data. And this, uh, this, is, this gives us the base factor, which is uh, uh, the ratio of the evidence for the ring planet model to the planet only model. If we observe uh, large values, say greater than three, it would indicate a significant evidence for the ring model. However, if it's less, it means that you only have comparable. And if it's less than one, it means that the planet only model is more favorable given the data. What we observed in our case is a bias factor of 1.5 which means that uh, the ring planet scenario is not significantly more uh, 
um, does not significantly have more evidence than the planet on the model. And I will discuss uh, the implications of this in a bit. Uh, but we remember that the ring planet model has four extra parameters um, than, the, than the planet on the model, which when performing this kind of analysis should have been penalized much more because of these extra wasteful parameters and should have had a lower evidence for this reason. But it's uh, interesting that it was able to have a comparable evidence despite uh, this penalty. So the schematic down here shows what we obtained for the ring planet, uh, ring planet solution. What we essentially observe here is a smaller planet with a radius now of just 3.7 Earth radii. And if we compute now the density with this value of the radius, we come up with a density, a higher density of 1.2 grams per cm cube, similar to what you would observe for uh, what, is a, what is measured for Uranus. Hence, this, can put, this is potentially solving uh, the anomalous density uh, situation. But we notice also that uh, the rings are extending from very close to the surface of the planet, up to 2.6 times uh, the radius of this planet. And this is required because uh, in order to produce the observed transit depth that is seen in the data, the rings need to be very large and somewhat close to face on. In this case, it's only 25 degrees away from the sky plane in order to block as much light as it can from the star. On the right side, you can see the light curve uh, and the fits to the light curve. And uh, you would notice that it is difficult to distinguish between uh, the ring planet fit and the planet only fit. And this is uh, essentially due to the fact that the ingress and the egress anomalies that we would expect due to the presence of rings are not clearly visible in this data. And this uh, has a consequence to why we, we actually had a very low Bayesian evidence for the ring planet model. Because if we were to observe some the anomalies, the expected anomalies in the egress and the ingress, it would have made the ring planet scenario much more favorable uh, than, than the case we have here. And Given the fact that uh, we don't observe also the, the anomalies is the reason that the, the ring is very close to the planet's surface because the gap between the planet's surface and the ring is very is uh, responsible for the amplitude of the anomalies. So with a smaller gap, we don't have that much anomaly. So in order for a ring planet scenario to actually mimic this data as it does here, uh, it would have to, uh, to have a ring that is close to the planet's surface. But this is not entirely strange because even in the case of Saturn, the D rings are very close uh, to the planets, even though they're not as thick or opaque as what we observe here. So essentially, it is actually possible that a, a, an opaque plant, an opaque ring around the planet could mimic uh, the, the transit light curve of a puffy planet. But there is still a lot of issues regarding this explanation that I'm going to get to in a bit if I have uh, enough time. And uh, given the fact that uh, we, we have a ring planet solution, there are a couple of things that we could try to estimate, uh, one of which is the density of the ring, pa ring particles. Knowing that the rings are usually found uh, within the Roche radius of a planet, uh, we can invert this formula to actually calculate uh, the density of the rings that could be sustained within this Roche radius if we assume that the outer radius of the ring is the edge uh, of the Roche radius. And when we do this, we come up with a density of just 1.08 grams per cm cube which is uh, really close to the density we would expect for icy materials. But the equilibrium temperature of this planet is 294 Kelvin, which is higher than the sublimation temperature of ice. Uh, so it is strange that we would have uh, ring mat materials that are similar to that of ice. What we would have expected was a ring material that is perhaps composed of silicates or rocky materials, which can, um, which can be sustained at these very high temperatures. But um, some studies have shown the possibility that ring particles could actually be composed of uh, porous silicates, in which case their densities could be as low as uh, what we observe here. But these cases are not quite known. And some asteroids, sorry? Okay. And some asteroids have been known to have uh, such low density. So perhaps it's possible that uh, some of these ring particles uh, are actually uh, porous silicate materials. So in any case, uh, we require further observation to be able, actually able to, to ascertain the true nature of this planet, if it's actually a perfect planet which still requires explanation, or it's a planet with rings. And one proposition is to actually observe this planet at very long uh, wavelengths, uh, in which case we might expect the rings to be uh, much more transparent than they are in the visible, and we would observe a lower transit, uh, transit depth. In this case, is the gray is the gray transit that I uh, that I show here in the transit light curve. 
So if we could observe this difference at a longer wavelength, then we would be able to uh, ascertain uh, uh, the true nature of this planet to perhaps be to the, due to the rings. But the fact that ring planets can appear as super puff does not mean that all super puffs can actually be explained by the presence of rings. Uh, for planets, especially most of the other super puffs except this one, they orbit very close to, their, to the stars, in which case the rush, the rush radius and the hill radius are very close to each other, which does not allow good stability for the ring particles. And also, if, uh, if, the rush, if the rush radius is very small, then the kind of ring particles that can be sustained will be very high density ring particles, and also because of the temperature of the planets really close to the planet, to the star. And, but such uh, high, highly dense uh, particles of uh, ring particles close to the planet would not actually uh, explain some of the, uh, the puffiness of, of these planets. So they are very, very, uh, they are very strange cases where you cannot actually explain a super puff planet by uh, by the presence of rings. This case is very uh, interesting because we were able to, even though there are still open questions as to the density of the rings and the possibility of it at all, and if we should actually have uh, some transparency at longer wavelengths. Other explanations have actually been uh, preferred to explain this puffiness of some of these planets, some of which include a thick extended atmosphere or a planet that is suffering from mass loss such that it raises dust into the atmosphere and could be optically thick enough to block enough starlight. But uh, some of these cases are actually uh, not, they've not been able to quite reproduce the observations because transit spectroscopy of some of these planets have been quite featureless. And this is not what we would have expected if we actually had a thick extended atmosphere. So we're still uh, trying to gain, get further or more precise observations of these targets to actually uh, probe if the, the depth or the low density is actually due to the presence of rings. Uh, I'd like to stop here, thank you. Thanks very much, Sunday. Really cool stuff. Do we have any questions? If so, please raise your hand in the participant window. Ah, Shani. Um, oh. oh, you can hear me, cool, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, good, great talk. I think found this very easy to follow and very interesting. So thank you. Um, I'm curious about the model that you're using to, to model the, like you're talking about the angle of the planet and that inclination with the star. It seems like there would be some degeneracy there. So I'm wondering like, are all of those parameters independent, the inner and outer radius and the radius of the planet and the inclination, or, or is, do we see some degeneracy between them? Yes, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, when it's in uh, the ring planet model, there are quite a number of degeneracies, like you said, and one of which is the inner radius and the outer radius of the planets. And basically how we constrained this was to actually use priors that actually uh, try to circumvent some of these problems. For instance, the, R, the outer radius of the planet should never be lower than the inner radius of the planets, for instance. And also the, the outer radius of the planet is calculated to be within three times, uh, three times the radius of the inner planet. So we put some constraints to actually make sure that it obeys what we actually observe uh, in the ring exoplanets. We know that rings are always within two, uh, uh, two to three uh, planetary radar as observed, for, as observed in Saturn and the rest of them. So we use this to constrain some of them. The inclination uh, can, can be degenerate, but we don't put any uh, any constraints on it because we need it to be completely free, but it can be constrained very well by the depth of the transit because it needs to be large enough to actually produce the, the transit depth that we observe. But a stricter rule needs to be put on the radius of the inner planets because this is degenerate again with the outer radius of the planet. It's possible to have a smaller planet and a bigger ring or a bigger planet and a smaller ring. But in this case, what we did was to use the di distribution of planets in the exoplanet database with similar uh, masses to what we observe for these planets. So we use this to actually form a distribution to constrain the possible values for the inner radius, uh, uh, for, the, for the radius of the planets. So yes, there's a lot of tricky going back and forth in order to make sure that we arrive at a solution that is not completely generated. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Great explanation. Shima, you had your hand up next. Uh, okay, yeah, so um, I think this actually works up. The last question works pretty well with my question. So it seems like um, 
the ring is close in to the surface of the planet and it's very wide, which a close in proximity makes sense. Um, but is the, uh, based on the solar system planets, is having a, a ring this wide relative to the size of this planet, uh, does that make sense um, given our understanding of rings? The size of the ring, uh, thank you for your question first. The size of the ring, yes, I don't think it's completely strange given that um, Saturn's ring extends up to five uh, Saturn radii. But of course, the main rings are within around three, uh, three Saturn radii. So this is just 2.6 uh, planetary radii. So I think it fits somewhat uh, similarly to what we observe uh, around Saturn. The, the difference I would say is because is that this is a completely opaque ring. And that is not what we ob ob obtain for Saturn. For Saturn, only the beer rings are some, uh, the beer rings are the most opaque and they don't extend this far. So it's quite tricky to know if uh, opaque rings can actually uh, extend this far. But from a theoretical standpoint, there's no reason why it cannot. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Dave? Well, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, I missed, where did this beautiful uh, light curve come from? Was it K2? Yes, it's K2. Oh, so it's going to be very hard to get another light curve uh, with this high quality. Indeed. <laughs> but HST can, I think, but not, not, uh, not with this much efficiency, I think. Yeah, too bad. And a period of 542 days, man, you were very patient. Ah, I, was, I wasn't a patient one, it was people, other people. So the first, time, the first time this planet was observed to transit, it was in one of the K2 campaigns and it was a, it was a mono transit. And it took actually uh, up to three orbital periods before they were able to detect an, another one. And there were degeneracies in the possible period of this planet because there were several possibilities and there were a lot of work to actually constrain the actual period of this planet. E eventually, they needed to perform, uh, to observe uh, with HARPS to actually get the, the, uh, the period of the planet. So I wasn't the patient one, actually, thank goodness. Well, okay, you were in the right place at the right time. At the right time, yes. <laughs> Manasa? Hi, great talk. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, uh, so you posited that the ring particles could potentially be made of porous silicates. Can you talk more about how you came to that potential conclusion? Did you use a suite of models to, to compare? Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, I didn't, I didn't use any models to actually uh, to, to come to this uh, proposition. Uh, but what I saw was that I, I looked into the database for density of some asteroids and, um, and porous materials that compose that are found in meteors and stuff like that. And I saw a list of densities that showed that it's possible to have some of these with densities close to one gram per cm cube and even lower for some carbonaceous chondrites and the rest like that. So I re realized that it's possible that uh, the ring materials could actually be composed of such materials. But uh, I don't know if this is actually uh, the case with any ring particles around any of the planets that we know. But if, if it can be found around this planet, at uh, this uh, object, then it's possible that they could break apart and actually still be rings around the planet. Okay, thank you. Erwin? You're muted at the moment, Erwin. Not yet. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. I was just curious as to what limits you might be able to place on the non-equatorial nature of some of these ringed planets. That is whether the rings are, what limits you can place on how far the ring could be from the equatorial region of the planet. You could presumably test that by the, the precession that might be induced were the ring non-equatorial. Have you thought at all about anything like that? Um, not entirely, but something that we did was to uh, compute the Laplace radius of the ring. And depending on, on, on how far the rings are from the Laplace, Laplace radius, you will tell if the rings will lie on the orbital plane or on the equatorial plane. 
from our calculations, I believe we, we found out that these rings were uh, consistent with being on the equatorial plane. This is the only calculation we did uh, in this regard. Thank you. I was thinking of an experimental observ you know, observation, how long you'd have to observe to see any precession, what limits you could place from the amount you have observed. Um, yeah, that, that is a good idea, actually. Yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't know right now how to uh, how we go about that. Prajwa, I think we can squeeze in your question. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering why do you have gaps in your data, and did you also use like campaign fifteen data in your analysis? Campaign five, I mean. I believe this were campaign two and 15, yeah. Ah, this is campaign 15 data, I believe. If this I remember. This is that. campaign 18, right? Oh, uh, perhaps. I, okay, I don't remember the actual campaign, but I believe these gaps are maybe data downloads or probably there were bad flags in the data. I think this was where the, the gaps are, yeah. Thank you. I guess it's fortunate you don't have any gaps in the ingress and egress though. Oh yes, that's really fortunate. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, I think that we're probably going to have to move on. So thanks again, Tunde, that was a really fascinating talk. And Sam Haddon will introduce our second speaker. Great, yeah. Um, so our second speaker today is uh, Gia Adams. Uh, she is a finishing undergraduate at Amherst College. Uh, where she has done work on uh, exoplanets uh, and in particular direct imaging. And she'll be joining us at the CFA starting, uh, I believe, in the fall. And um, today she's going to tell us about optimization techniques for exoplanet direct imaging. So I'll let you take it away. Oh, thank you, Sam. I'll just share my screen now. Uh... Yeah, so as Sam said, uh, my name is Jaya. I am a senior at Amherst College, and today I'm going to talk to you about my senior thesis, which I'm really excited to share. So direct imaging, as I'm sure some of you know, is a method of exoplanet detection where we actually take photos of planets around their host stars. And if you've ever heard an imager talk about this, I'm sure what they told you is they love being able to see planets. They love being able to point to things and know they're real. It gives them a sense of visceral satisfaction. And it should because it's a really, really difficult thing to do. So ever since I was a first year at Amherst, I've been working on the giant accreting protoplanet survey. And this is a search for planets that might be growing within the gaps of circumstellar disks. So we think that when we see these types of gaps in disks, that there might be planets in there that are scooping out that material and accreting it onto themselves. Gap planets imaged 15 extrasolar systems to study this, and we found no new companions and the companions that we already knew were in the data sets and that we should be able to detect, we were not detecting very well at all. So we usually have a threshold of needing to detect a planet above five sigma or around five sigma to really count it as a detection. And we only had one planet that was actually an M dwarf that we detected above that threshold. So we weren't doing really well at all. And this is a part of the problem with imaging is that it's really difficult to see dim planets behind really bright starlight. There are two things you can do to fix this problem, and that's just get better data. We need more powerful instruments. But that's not what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Instead, I'll be talking to you about software and what we can do there. Algorithms are an incredibly important part of imaging. They're vital because when we first take a photo of an extrasolar system, it looks like this. It looks like just starlight or the stellar PSF spread out in some way. And there's no way for us to see a planet in this data. So what we do is we make a model of the starlight and just the starlight so that hopefully when we subtract that starlight model, we will reveal any planets that were hidden there behind that starlight. In principle, this sounds pretty straightforward, but the most common starlight subtraction algorithm, PyClip, requires over two 
thousand user input parameters in order for this to work. And some of them you can kind of guess and leave to their defaults and it'll be okay. But many of them have a much bigger impact on detections than we thought they did. A previous thesis student, Claire Leonard, she made this uh, little plot here. It's a grid search um, exploring different parameters. I won't go into detail about what these two parameters are, annuli and movement, but basically annuli is how we split an image up to build the starlight model, and movement is how many reference images we use to build that model, where higher movement means using less images. What she found was that if you got a good set of parameters, like right here, you could make a detection that was really clear and bright. It's undeniable that that's a planet to us. But there was this whole other region of parameter space where you wouldn't just get a bad detection, you would not detect the planet at all. So the planet is not visible anywhere in this data set. It's hard to tell that there's anything there. And unfortunately, there is no way yet for us to tell what good parameters are before we do this. So if you're doing a blind exoplanet search and you have no idea whether or not there are any planets in your data, if you ha happen to choose bad parameters, um, you might not find anything when there really was something. So what most imagers do is they guess, they tweak their parameters, they hope that they get lucky. And this inevitably leads to either a lot of false positives, um, a lot of false negatives, or the planets that we detect, we do not detect them at their optimal signal to noise ratio. So we could be making our detections a lot better than they are. And this is where my thesis comes in. What I'm trying to do is to figure out how we can make our detections better by simply improving the way we select algorithm parameters and therefore, you know, um, improving our starlight model, because if we can make that better, then the subtraction is better, and then the planet is better revealed. I grouped these parameters into two different bins. Um, I wrote independent here. What I really should have put was uncorrelated, because that's what I mean, not independent in the traditional sense, but more so that I can tweak these parameters without affecting any of the other parameters. And there were two things I used to study these. So the first is contrast curves, which are plots of the ratio of planet brightness to star brightness versus the planet separation from its host star. And the way that I would interpret a plot like this is that closer to the host star, around seven pixels away maybe, we would need the contrast ratio to be high because we would need the planet to be very bright in order for us to see it. Then as we go further away, the planet can get dimmer and it can be dimmer and we can still see it because the starlight is also getting dimmer and isn't affecting us as much. Now, because of the nature of these plots, a better contrast curve would be one that's lower. And so what I look for is for parameters that will drop this contrast curve. If I make it worse, then the contrast curve will go up and it'll be worse and things will be less detectable. The other thing that I used was ROC curves or receiver operating characteristic curves, where these are plots of the true positive fraction of detections versus the false positive fraction. And a good parameter would maximize true positives while staying really low in the false positive range. So I'm looking for things high in this left hand corner. And in this example, I just chose the random smoothing parameter. Smoothing of two is clearly really bad because it's just low. We don't get a lot of true positives there. Um, but zero Zero and one look pretty good, and I would probably choose one here, but it doesn't look like it matters very much because in both cases we have a high true positive fraction. So I use these two curves to optimize on things like high pass filtering, which is just how we attenuate starlight and make it a little bit easier to see the planet, and also smoothing, which helps reduce pixel to pixel noise. Um, but these two, again, are parameters that turn out to make a big difference in addition to a few others. And then there are the correlated parameters. So we're back to this annual movement plot. When we're imaging planets here for this specific survey, we're relying on the fact that growing planets or creating protoplanets should be brighter at H alpha. But because we're still in the visible light regime, if we move over just a little bit, bit to a nearby wavelength, the planets should no longer be there because they're just not visible in that range. And we'll call this nearby wavelength the continuum. Now, we wanted to use a trick where we inject fake planets into the continuum wavelength range, then run Claire's parameter explorer grid there, 
figure out what the best parameters were for those fake planets, and then apply them to data sets that were at H alpha and hopefully be able to detect to detect real planets there. So this was the only thing that we could think of that would help us in a blind planet search where we had no idea where any planets were. We could use our fake planets. Luckily, this is not a completely blind search for me. I do know where some planets are in some of our data sets. And so I can also make a parameter explorer grid for the real planet and compare it to how well the fake planet grid did. And what I'm looking for is something that is pretty close, which these are. The best case scenario is that the optimal parameters match. And that tells us we're doing really good. We can really use um, fake planets to find the real planet. The good news is that in every case that I have tested so far, using fake planets allowed us to find parameters that at least detected the real planet. It didn't always detect it at the best signal to noise ratio, the one that I knew was achievable, but being able to detect them at all was something that we weren't necessarily able to say before. And because we know this is working now, we can use these types of grids to study other things like how does data set quality affect the optimal parameters? How does it change the shape of this thing? And how does the planet position change the shape of the parameter explorer? So these are the kinds of questions I'm interested in answering. And I'll show you some of our preliminary results now. So I tested these techniques on the HD 142527 data set, which has an M dwarf. And this was the bright detection that I was talking about before. So we previously detected it at an SNR 5.9. And after these optimization techniques, I was able to take that to 12.6 sigma. Then a few years later, the M dwarf has moved some, it's over here. And this would be considered a non-detection because it's a 2.1 sigma here, it doesn't reach the five sigma threshold. I was able to optimize it to 5.6 sigma. And then the last one I'm gonna show is this one where the SNR was 1.8. So clearly a non-detection and the location where the M dwarf should be is it's just not there. And then here, even though the data set is a little noisy, um, we can still see the M dwarf now and it was detected at 4.7 sigma. So in every case, I was able to more than double um, our detection or, or S the SNR of our detection by using these optimization techniques. And my hope is to now apply these techniques to all the other data sets that, have, that are in the GAP planet survey and be able to detect the planets that we know are there even better. So there's the PDS 70 planets, there's the calcium 15 planets. And what I would really like, what would be a dream would be to find new planets, um, something that was just so rare in imaging, um, but that's that's my hope. And I also found out some information about the data set quality that it data set quality can impact how well optimization is able to work. So I will likely just have to work with our highest quality data from now on. And some future work, um, does the planet position play a role? It's funny because I, I actually did this yesterday and found out that it does indeed play a role in a very systematic way in how the best parameters change. But also um, I'm excited to explore how this translates to other instruments because I've only been working with Magellan data so far, but do these techniques apply in the same way uh, to other telescopes? So yeah, um, thank you so much for listening to me. I'd be happy to take any questions now. Great, thank you. Um, so if there's questions, uh, Please raise your hand in the participants window and I can call on you. Uh, yeah. Sean, let's see. Go ahead. Oh, oh, did you see me? Yep. Okay. Sorry. All right. Jaya, very well done. This is so cool. I didn't um, know the details of your undergrad research and this is amazing what you've done. So congratulations. Um, I'm curious, do you have any plans to make this like uh, into a package that other people can use? Um, or are you just, you know, going to try to bust through a bunch of these targets yourself or maybe a little bit of both? Yeah, that's a great question. So ideally, I would like to do both. Um, our code is pretty bad right now. <laughs> it's very much just us playing around with things. Um, but 
after I go through all of these data sets and I'm able to pick out any targets that we missed before, any, any planets that are hidden in there, then I hope to turn this into an actual package that we can release and maybe help other imagers with. Awesome. I'm sure it would be a very valued tool among the community. Thank you. Erwin? First of all, I want to say that was a phenomenal talk. I thought it was just great. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, que the question I had concerned your statement that you didn't know how these techniques would work on data from other telescopes. And I was wondering what was on your mind as to the differences that the telescopes would make, the different telescopes would make to your ability to use these algorithms? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, so one of the things that we've noticed so far, just working with some simulated JWST data is that the shape of these parameter explorers, so being really bright in this corner and then getting dimmer as you go further out, was very specific to Magellan. Um, but then when we tried it on the simulated JWST data, that wasn't necessarily the case. It did have a shape, but not the same shape. Um, and so I guess the best case scenario would be able to say, oh, it will always be at a movement of one or two or three, but that might not be true for every instrument. So the hope is to try it for a few different telescopes, data from a few different telescopes, and figure out how the shape of these parameter combinations changes um, with those different instruments. Thank you. Yeah. Dave? Hi, Jaya. Thanks for that talk. Uh, could I ask about your M dwarf detection? Uh, what was the angular separation from the host star in your typical detections? I don't see a scale on these figures. Is it a few arc seconds or what is it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So this, I know at the top of my head is about 9.8 pixels and our pixel scale was I think 7.8, so that's our plate scale. So I believe that takes us to around 70 something arc seconds. Yes. Okay. Um, I, yes, I think this was, it was 77 and then um, these ones are much closer. <laughs> it, it's a big separation, okay. And um, what kind of contrast ratio did you get? In other words, the ratio of the brightness of the M dwarf to the host star. Do you know that number? So I think in the best data sets, we can get that to 10 to the minus three. Okay. Um, but that's in the very best. Usually it actually stays somewhere around 10 to the minus two. Um, that is, I, I think, the more typical range at this separation for this M dwarf. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Hey, hey, Gia, great, great stuff. Um, so looking at this figure, I see that uh, you have like, uh, so the signal to noise what figure of 5.6, you have uh, two bright regions. Um, and so like, obviously the goal is to maximize true positives and minimize false positives. Um, but in this situation, you know what, that, that there's only one planet, but how would you differentiate uh, the fake or the, you know, the systematic signal there on the right with the uh, true signal of the planet that uh, you detect at 5.6 sigma? That is a really good question because when I first saw this blob, I got really excited and I was hoping maybe it's a maybe it's something that we missed before. I don't think it is, um, but this blob is actually at three sigma. So right off the bat, I kind of just discredited it because it didn't pass the threshold. But one of the main ways that we hope to get rid of something like this are is with uh, smoothing. So if I smooth an image enough, the hope would be that anything that is planet light would be retained and anything that is not will start to go away. 
in this case, this blob is so spread out, it might not be. So this, this specifically is something we actually probably have to take a closer look at because typically if we see bright spots like this, it'll be more like this case where the pixels are just randomly bright and go word smoothing, but something clustered in this way is very suspicious. So yeah, I'm not sure how we'll get rid of it yet or if we want to get rid of it, maybe it's a nice surprise. Okay, cool. Cool. Great. Do we have any last questions? All right. I uh, just want to say thanks to both of our speakers one more time. Uh, two great yeah, talks. Thank you very much, Bo. And Unless there's any further announcements, I believe we'll be seeing you next week at the same time. That's correct, yeah. And I've also been asked to announce that the abstract deadline for the test science conference is this Friday. So if you're planning to attend, then please submit your abstracts. Thank you, everyone. And thanks again to our speakers. Thank you all so much. <laughs>